Hey, this is Andy from Sweet Editions. So I've decided to jump into the fire pit and try to give my take on whether we're in a real estate bubble and if it's still a good idea to purchase and duplex a property. Whether Canada's experiencing a pandemic housing bubble or not. Others are not so afraid to use the word bubble. With bubble when I think about it. An outright bubble. This might be one of the biggest bubbles of all time. Would I be going out and buying a home today as an investment in Canada uh, or in the GTA? Absolutely not. Before we start, please take a millisecond and gently tap that thumbs up button until it turns blue and punch that subscribe button to get more awesome content. Thanks so much. Now understand I'm not an economist or market analyst, but I think many of you agree that even these so-called experts don't really have any ideas either. I certainly think that many don't. So why do I think I'm qualified to discuss this topic? Well, I don't think I really do, but I have been an active investor for over a decade with boots on the ground knowledge on real estate, house construction, and what it takes to add value to a property. Plus, I get a lot of people asking me all the time what I think of the market. So it gets to my head sometimes and I'm here just to give my two cents for what it's worth. Now, don't make any investment decisions based on what I say here. Do your own research to determine what works best for you. Additionally, remember, there's no single real estate market. Prices are going to vary based on location and type of real estate. A small town with a single industry is going to perform very differently than a larger city with a more diverse economy. The type of real estate is important. There's low rise, condo apartments, commercial, industrial real estate that's all going to have different outcomes. For residential, is it single or multifamily? These are all important differences. For the purposes of our discussion, we're just going to focus on single family housing. So bubble talk is nothing new. We've been hearing about it for over a decade now. But lately, given how frothy the market has been, despite the pandemic and widespread economic hardship for a vast part of the population, it seems real estate is defying all odds. In March 2021, the Toronto market for single detached homes has gone up over 20% year over year. In Hamilton, where many people have moved to or invested in to get a more affordable price, single family homes have gone up a staggering 35% year over year. And it's not just here in the GTA, it's happening across the country. So given what we're seeing, I would say that yes, we're definitely in a real estate bubble. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Okay, just kidding, I'm back. So we've confirmed that we're in a real estate bubble, but I'm still personally buying real estate. Why is that? So I'm gonna spend the next few minutes explaining why despite a real estate bubble, I'm still buying. Really, the question is not whether we're in a real estate bubble. That part is clear. The question is whether the bubble will pop anytime soon. Surely 20 to 30% year over year returns are not normal. But guess what? There's a lot that's not normal right now. And we'll get more into that later. The overall bubble that we're in right now can go either way. And it's based on macroeconomic trends that we really have no control over. These include aspects such as interest rates, immigration levels, fiscal and monetary policy, and the broader economy. Given that there is so much outside of our control, is it still worth investing in a property where you can potentially duplex or add additional suites? I'm going to say yes, with the reason that although you and I have no control over the macro economy, there's so much in the micro economy we actually do have control over. So let's go through some of the aspects that we do have the ability to control. First, you can choose which city or town you want to invest in. There are municipalities that have great leadership and are more focused on growth with a diverse economy and generally wants to be competitive. Plus, many municipalities are targets for provincial growth plans. I recommend that you check out ontario.ca slash growth plan. Second, within a city, you can determine where the pockets of growth are going to be by going to a city's website and browsing through their official plan documents and attending planning committee and council meetings. These days, because of the pandemic, many of these meetings have actually been moved online and you can even find out what their plans are on their YouTube channels. You can even listen to these exciting city meetings in the background while playing video games. By going through city documents and being a part of the meeting, you can find out the areas that are targeted for growth and funding. These could be business improvement areas, areas where zoning is being changed for more densification or transportation improvements. This is the equivalent of insider information when investing in stocks that is actually legal and even better, entirely free. Third, the type of property is something you certainly have control over. You can choose a property that will likely be more insulated from a severe economic downturn. I generally like investing in modest single family homes, especially the ones built in mid 20th century post-war to about 1970. 
These homes are well built, have great bones, and are generally in desirable neighborhoods. These homes are also both an upgrade and a downgrade for a large segment of the population. Many people moving up the social ladder will target these properties, and they're also a target for people in larger luxury homes that are trying to downsize. Fourth, is it a property where you can add forced appreciation to and not just rely solely on the market? Are you able to add rooms, additions, curb appeal, and cosmetic upgrades to get a higher selling price, rental rate, or a higher appraisal if you were to reappraise using the burst strategy? You can always mitigate a downturn by forcibly adding value to a property through improvements. Fifth, are there great cash flow options? Can you use the space efficiently to generate cash flow? Are you able to rent out individual parts of the property, either short term or long term? For those who are familiar with the house hacking strategy, primarily used by younger homeowners who are more flexible, house hacking and renting out individual rooms help to reduce or even eliminate housing expenses. Another example are garages and even sheds that are rented out for storage. You may have heard of setscouter.com where homeowners rent out a part of their house for one-off photo or video shoots if you have a unique property. Use your imagination here. There are so many things that can be done. Number six, and this is the big one for me and what I strongly recommend everyone to do to their property if possible, and that's add additional units. This can be done in the form of converting to a duplex, three units, or even more. And with Provincial Bill 108 in Ontario, the More Homes, More Choice Act, many cities will be allowing garden suites, also known as coach houses or detached accessory units to be built in your yards as third units. This can significantly increase your cash flow and even boost the value of your property. This ties into the third point about choosing the type of property. You certainly can't add more units in a condo apartment. Item number seven, even though we talked about not being able to time the overall market cycles and economy, there's a lot of data out there showing that you can at least time the seasonal market cycles. Data shows that prices generally peak in the spring and the fall, and prices are lower in the months of December and August. This makes a lot of sense as December is the holiday season and August is when everyone is off on summer vacation. So if you're lucky, you may be able to snap up a deal during these slower times. Now understand that also there's going to be less inventory during these slower periods. So you're not going to have as many options to choose from. Now for the last point, it's also important to be a savvy negotiator and not overpay for property. There's plenty of resources out there to learn to be a great negotiator. If you're able to get a lower than market value price, then you've also gained a bit of buffer in case of a market downturn. For a seller of a property, sometimes it's not just about how much money they can get. You may be able to help solve a problem for them, such as flexibilities with closings, assisting with transitioning from the property, or perhaps providing them with a vendor take back mortgage where you essentially take a loan from them for the property. It's important to create a win-win situation as part of any transaction. So I've outlined eight things that we have direct control over to mitigate a real estate downturn compared to the macroeconomic factor that we don't have any control over. And this is why, despite the fact that we're in a bubble, I'm still looking to buy real estate. Not because I'm necessarily bullish on the overall market because we really don't know, but it's because there are things that I can do to mitigate losses or even gain despite a downturn in the market. Now back to the issue of macroeconomics and the things that we can't control. As it stands, the Bank of Canada and central banks around the world have committed to near zero interest rates for the foreseeable future. And you might even hear about negative interest rates, which are already happening in Europe. Now, keep in mind that these are not the same interest rates for your mortgage. This is for large institutional and sovereign wealth funds that have so much money, they literally don't know what to do with it, except to put it in a bank and pay a fee to do so. The amount of money being printed has exploded. Over 30% of all the money that exists today has been freshly printed in the last year. So you have to understand that a lot of the price increases in real estate is really a decline in your currency rather than an actual increase in the house itself. We're now living in a monetary experiment that has never worked throughout history, which is the idea that we can print money on our way to prosperity. I personally don't believe the inflation index in Canada of just over 1% is anywhere near the truth, unless you don't believe that people need things like housing, food, energy, education, and healthcare. If we can live on flat screen TVs alone, then yes, probably there's no inflation. Governments are going into massive debts with insane fiscal spending and loose monetary policy. At the same time, Canada is targeting a record 400,000 new immigrants each year, and we're projected to be short on housing units by the rate of tens of thousands of units every year in Ontario. Anyways, I've digressed into a long rant about the larger economy 
It's a strange world we're living in. So even the one thing that we don't have control over, it seems to me it still favors the continuation of property prices in one direction, and that's up. But again, I'm not banking on that. I'm relying on the eight things outlined earlier that I do have direct control over, and it's important to take a long-term approach. In any investing, it's all about allocation of risks. We live in an environment where your cash may not be safe from serious inflation. And whether you invest in real estate or any other investment or do nothing at all, you're still making a decision. Additionally, you need to look at your personal circumstances, which will be the main determining factor in whether you should be investing or not. Now, do you already own property and have assets? Do you have sufficient income and savings to carry you through any tough times? Or are you over leveraged and in credit card debt? If you're in the latter category, you should definitely not be investing in real estate. And if it works from a personal standpoint, then it may make sense for you to still look into real estate as a viable investment option. My belief is that whatever the conditions, you have the ability to take action of some sort, but that action needs to be thought through carefully and you need to control the risks as best as possible. To illustrate this point, I'll use an analogy from my old days participating and running two Dragon Boat teams. Whenever we approached big waves and choppy waters because of a speedboat passing through, we had to keep paddling through it. That was the best way to mitigate the effects of big waves. As mentioned, with any action or non-action, you're still taking a position. For those on the sidelines holding cash, you may be losing a significant amount of value every year, possibly in the double digits. So what position are you going to take? So this video is recorded in April 2021, but really the principles discussed here are evergreen. Remember, in real estate, it's impossible to time the broad market, and that's why the information here should be valuable even in a different market condition. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it was helpful to you. So what are your thoughts? In addition to the eight items I outlined above to control the value of your property, was there anything I missed or could have included? Do you agree or disagree? Please share your comments below. And again, it would be really helpful if you can like this video, subscribe to our channel for more videos. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in. If you want to learn more about investing in housing densification, and how you can get involved, hit that subscribe button. I put together a beginner's guide and also a handy eight point checklist that covers everything you need to know about adding a legal second suite. We cover important bylaw and building code requirements for cities in Ontario and all the design considerations you need to make to successfully complete your project. You can download that through the link in the description below. Until next time, to your success.